Welcome to the New Britain Museum of American Art. This museum has been named the first museum of solely American art in the country. It is located on Lexington Avenue in New Britain, Connecticut, and began in a house right next door, which was donated by a New Britain philanthropist named Grace Judd Landers after she passed away. The Landers House functioned as a museum for decades, and only in 2006 did the museum begin to expand outward. You can read a more detailed account of the museum's art collection in the label shown here, but one of the main points was that the NBMAA was established as an art museum in 1903 with its first purchases of art. The New Britain Museum of American Art is known for its outstanding collection from three centuries of our nation's artists. Our tour will be chronological, as the museum is generally laid out in this way. We'll begin in colonial America during the mid to late 18th century, the Hudson River School of the 1800s, American Impressionism of the late 1800s, everyday life in the early 20th century, and then end with some more contemporary works. It's important to remember that this is a museum of American art, and our country is a young country compared to all of the others in the world. For this reason, American art does not date back thousands of years as European, Egyptian, Asian, and other cultures do. You won't find ancient artifacts in this museum as you will at the Yale Museum in New Haven, the Wadsworth Athenaeum in Hartford, or the Met in New York City. The distinguishing feature of the New Britain Museum of American Art is that it's entirely American. The earliest works we'll see in the NBMAA's collection begins in the mid-1700s, and they are European-influenced. There were no art schools in America at this time, so American artists were trained and apprenticed in the classical European style. During this time of the 1750s to early 1800s, portraiture is the main type of art we would see. This is during colonial America, and portraits of wealthy merchants were very popular. These paintings were made to show the prestige of these prominent figures, as in this painting of Benjamin Coleman, painted by John Smybert, circa 1740. We can see that the subject in this painting was a notable figure by his richly colored clothing, his posture, and the letter in his hand which is inscribed to him as a merchant. Included in the portraiture gallery, we see prominent figures from after the time of the American Revolution. This includes a portrait of George Washington painted by Rembrandt Peel. And according to my internet search, Rembrandt Peel painted no fewer than 79 portraits of George Washington. Rembrandt Peel was supposedly the last artist that Washington sat for before his death. There are also portraits painted of indigenous leaders at this time by George Catlin. In the 1830s, he traveled over 1,800 miles to paint the Native American peoples along with their culture and landscape. In Catlin's words, he was interested in preserving the looks and customs of the vanishing race of Native man in America. Now moving on to the Hudson River School. From about 1825 to the 1870s, Artists were inspired to travel and immortalize landscapes untouched by man. This was the time of the Industrial Revolution, which was spreading from the East Coast. There were crowded cities, factories, and pollution that these artists wanted to escape, and by doing so, the artists created a movement of painting landscapes that others wished to follow. The father of this generation of landscape painters was Thomas Cole. Here we can see the gorgeous view he depicted of the Catskill Mountains in New York. The mountains and the wilderness feel endless. This gallery full of landscape paintings generally gives a feeling of romanticized environments. You'll see hardly, if any, buildings, and even any inclusion of people is somewhat of an insignificant piece of the painting. The focus is on the landscape itself and some of the artists idealized the land to make it appear even more perfect than it did in reality. Even this painting of West Rock, New Haven, created by Frederick Edwin Church, who was Thomas Cole's most famous pupil, was somewhat idealized. At the time that Church painted West Rock, which is actually in New Haven, Connecticut, there were already some buildings, houses, and factories built up there, all signs of man. 
Church chose to leave these things out of his painting in order to focus on the perfect representation of the land. It was also known to emphasize light, as you can see a huge portion of this painting is just sky. And there were also religious or spiritual aspects to his paintings. On a side note, if you look closely, you'll see the small church steeple trademark that he used in his work representing his last name, Church. Let's take a look at Thomas Moran's painting of the wilds of Lake Superior. This painting was named after Lake Superior, but based on some research, it seems to be a hybrid of locations that may have included some of Moran's travels to central Pennsylvania. While he was on his travels, he would sketch his surroundings, and then later on when he returned home, he would create his painting. He would omit any indication of commerce and only include the beautiful nature, which was apparently from more than one source. Our last stop in the Hudson River School is a favorite to many, Seal Rock, painted by Albert Bierstadt. This is a painting romanticizing the Farallon Islands, which are 26 miles west of San Francisco. At the time that Bierstadt traveled here, it was breeding season for the sea lions, so he was able to sketch a number of studies of the sea lions, birds, rock formations, and the water. This can aptly be described as a noisy painting. Why do you think that could be? If you stare at it for a moment, I think you can imagine the noise of the sea lions barking, the crashing of the waves, and you might even feel the wind and sea spray on your face. I personally have always loved how translucent the blue-green of the ocean wave is. It feels like water. Before we move forward from the landscapes, I'd like to add that some may say that the Hudson River School is arguably the most impactful contribution from America's art to the world. Still in the late 19th century, but moving on to a different subject matter at the time of the rapidly modernizing world, we see hollyhocks, painted in 1876 by artist Eastman Johnson. This is an example of romanticizing a scene in a different way. Rather than idolizing the beauty of untainted nature, we are seeing a nostalgic scene of leisure and simplicity. These elegant women are in a beautiful garden, calmly picking flowers, and are fully sheltered from any concern of the outside world. Paintings of leisure and outdoor activities became increasingly popular among the urbanized elite of the time. Continuing on to the late 1800s, we are now entering American Impressionism. We'll continue to see an influence of European artists on the American painters. We think of Impressionist painters to include Monet, Van Gogh, Degas, just to name a few. But the influence of this style of art made its way over to America and took a strong hold. When we think of Impressionist art, we think of artists painting en plein air, which means painting outside and on the spot, instead of going back into their studios to paint from sketches. Their subjects were focused on the ordinary of daily life, and they wanted to convey the impression of their subject. They did this through quick, broken brushstrokes and largely unblended color. Our first work painted by American artist Frederick Child Hassam is a painting of the Grand Prix, which is a horse race that takes place annually in Paris. As an American living in Paris, he was interested in capturing the city life of the Parisians. When we take a closer look, we can see his take on the short, broken brushstrokes of various colors influenced by the Impressionist painting style. And another example of an Impressionist-inspired painting made by Frederick Carl Frisike. Frisike was an American artist who also spent time in France in the village of Giverny, about 40 miles northwest of Paris. His subject was largely the female figure outdoors. We can see the influence of the Impressionist style with his choppy brushstrokes and bright saturated colors making up the flowers and leaves in the background. He also took inspiration in his painting from Japanese prints and Art Nouveau, which other artists of the time did as well. Moving on to the early 20th century urban life. The first art movement in the new century in America was called the Ashcan School. This was an artistic movement with works portraying scenes of everyday life in New York City. It was following impressionist art 
with still some influence of Europe, so you may notice some hints from the prior movement even though the artists at this time are intentionally moving away from Impressionism. The paintings of this time were made with thick paint and applied in rapid, obvious brushstrokes, but often using a muted or dark palette. I always think of Ashcan painting as a bit grungier and sometimes dirty feeling. In my opinion, this painting by Gifford Beale titled Elevated Columbus Avenue, New York is a perfect example of this. Imagine New York City in the early 1900s, busy with people, trains, skyscrapers, and factories built, plus horses still being used for transportation. There isn't any nature depicted in this painting. It's all city with metal beams and brick buildings. Everything minus the people and horses are now man-made in this piece. It's a cold, snowy time of the year, but even the snow doesn't look like clean, bright snow because of all of the people and horses walking through it. It probably gets dirty pretty much immediately. It looks like everyday life in a busy city. As this painting made by Everett Chin takes place inside a nightclub, he includes some brighter colors depicting the dancer on stage while he keeps the musicians in the front more in the dark. He gives us a more realistic feel of being in a nightclub and watching the performance by having the musicians in your way and partially obstructing our view, as would be the case if we were watching the show in person. Shin was known as a popular chronicler of his time and its entertainments. Although there are many artists who focused their efforts on painting urban life, other artists such as Rockwell Kent painted some wonderful paintings of nature in a similar way that the Hudson River School artist wanted to get away from the growing city life and go back to nature. Going back to nature will probably be a theme for artists until the end of time. In Rockwell Kent's case, he was inspired to go to Monhegan Island off the coast of Maine, a well-known summer destination for tourists and artists, and focus on nature for a while, however still in a way to include daily life. In the case of Kent, the daily tasks that he depicts in his painting are fishermen making their way as toilers of the sea. Continuing on with the 1930s, we are now in a gallery filled entirely with Thomas Hart Benton's murals. These murals show everyday life in different parts of the country during the time of the Great Depression. Benton traveled throughout the country during the 20s and 30s and was able to experience a variety of people living their lives. The majority of his works were made from his own eyewitness accounts, while some were more romanticized. These paintings were intended to celebrate America's identity. This shows one view of a wall in this gallery, showing the arts of life in America, arts of the city. The New Britain Museum of American Art is also known for its collection of pulp art. Pulp art refers to the eye-catching illustrations used for pulp fiction, the entertainment novels enjoyed and used as a means to escape during the time of the Great Depression through World War II. The reason that pulp is part of the name here is because this amazing artwork was the cover for the low-grade wood pulp paper that the text was printed on for the novels. Artists at this time painted their cover art illustrations to pay their bills and for a one-time use, so oftentimes they would paint over their works of art or even throw them away. The museum is fortunate to have been gifted a number of pulp illustrations, as they also show a part of our American culture. Here we see the vibrant and dynamic illustration of a Doc Savage book. And then another from Private Detective. These are only two of the many impressive works of pulp art in the NBMAA's collection. This is one of my favorite paintings at the museum, painted by Maxfield Parrish. Dusk was painted in the mid-1900s, and although it was originally made as a landscape painting, it later was used to illustrate popular calendars. Parrish is best known for his meticulously detailed paintings of dreamlike landscapes, and he is famous for using the beautiful blue you see in this piece. And finally, we will view a handful of more contemporary artworks. This first piece is a very large and powerful piece that was commissioned by the New Britain Museum of American Art to commemorate the tragedy of 9-11 when the World Trade Towers were bombed. The artist Graydon Parrish states that his concept of the painting has likewise evolved from an image of writhing, suffering figures to one which attempts to embody less tenable emotions. 
He developed the two central twin figures of tragedy and terror, blindfolded and screaming at heaven in despair, with turmoil represented on either side and all meticulously painted. Switching gears, let's visit Dale Chihuly's installation sculpture piece that can be seen hanging in the staircase leading down to the education wing of the museum. This chandelier sculpture is a blown glass sea form exploration. The curved tentacle-like pieces add up to 257 intricate pieces. It's definitely worth viewing in person. One of the benches that can be found scattered throughout the museum is this grizzly bear bench. It's made entirely of bronze cast and is a favorite of many museum visitors. It's also believed that if you rub his nose, you'll have good luck. As in many of the earlier works of art we looked at, even current day artists will use their heritage for inspiration. Nagar Akami, for example, fused her Iranian heritage with her American identity to create a contemporary standout piece. This painting is full of beautifully inspired Persian elements with vibrant swirls of glitter crusted blue and green, but also painted with a uniquely Western imagination. And lastly, I wanted to end on a piece that is currently on display at the New Britain Museum of American Art. It's on loan from the Yale New Haven Children's Hospital, and it's by artist Rashmi Talbaid. She is a collage artist and led a collaborative community project to create amazing collages, this one chronicling one of the four seasons, Fall Garden. There's a lot going on in this piece, but it still has a cohesive theme, especially made clear with its use of autumn colors. I hope you've enjoyed your virtual tour of the New Britain Museum of American Art. Hopefully you've been inspired and plan to visit the museum in person sometime soon.